Welcome to a Celtic State of Minds Screamer Celica, Kevin Graham. Explain what is this show all about? This show is about we have a look back at a famous album or an album that's influenced my life and what Celtic were up to at that time. But there's been a slight change to the way that we look at it because this is a new format, new studio. I'm going to give you a what-if scenario for round about that time because we've spoke about albums that um, I like but there's been a number of albums released on the same number of years that we've already spoke about those seasons. Yeah, true. So, so I've decided to go back in and have a look to see what if this would have happened. What if something... What if... Also with the album, if I can get a link to something that would lead to a parallel universe, I go that way as well. So I've got two today. So I think... I think if I was young and trendy, I think they're called hot takes. I think that. I think young that's and what trendy. Now, Kevin, it's also that's... a good way of taking a wee diversion from what we've been talking about over the last several weeks in the world of Celtic. So we're taking a step back in time. We're going to talk about a historical element of Celtic's uh, fairly recent past, and you'll be talking about where we were back then as well. So first and foremost, where are you taking us back to? What's the month and the year? I'm taking us back to today, June 1999. June 99. And at that point, where were we in the world of Celtic? We were in between managers at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were in between Joseph Vengloss and John Barnes. Dr. Joe, right. Now, many, many Celtic fans will remember the one season stint of Dr. Joe, who took over after the departure of Vim Janssen, who stopped the 10. Mm Mm-hmm. Could be quite relevant this season. And uh, tell me a wee bit more about Dr Joe then. Dr Joe arrived with not much fanfare. Uh, he was utterly ridiculed in the press when when he when he was announced as Celtic manager. Quite bizarre really, yeah. It's quite at his bizarre when you career. look at his record. Yep. He was one of the most highly respected coaches in world football. Mm. He won the 1976 Euros with the che- uh, Czechoslovakia. He won the under-23 Euro- uh, European Championships with Czechoslovakia as well. He got to the quarter-final of the World Cup in 1990. Mm. He was on FIFA's technical committee when we appointed him uh, as our manager. Part of that squad, the 1990 squad, was a certain Lubomir Moravchik, am I right? Moravchik. He was recommended to Celtic by Gerard Hooley. Mm. Gerard Hooley was also on that FIFA technical committee and Hooley was also linked with the Celtic job plenty of times but when I think Hooley became Liverpool manager at that point yep. and he says he couldn't go back on that but for us to have a look at Dr Joe Venglos mm-hmm. bizarrely and this is another twist of fate Egil Olsen nearly got the job before eh, Venglos Egil Olsen, the welly wearing Norwegian, All right. nearly got the job. But the reason he didn't get it, because he would have to put his dog into quarantine for three months. And that put we him off. know how that feels. <laughs> and that put him off taking the job. Well, you see, when you think back to, to Venglis, a couple of things come to my mind. Firstly, was a story I read about his time at Aston Villa. And he tried to introduce a lot of different methods, Kevin, that maybe the uh, homegrown players at Villa didn't um, accept, and I say homegrown as in English or British players, didn't really buy into his methods. And it was things that seemed pretty simple now, like um, ice baths and all that kind of stuff. So this was introduced by Venglos back in the early 90s to Aston Villa. And I remember um, speaking to a fairly prominent Celtic coach who said that this was the only Celtic manager he didn't rate as well and I asked him for an example and he said that he used to do like a seven aside thing with no ball you know, playing seven, seven sides with no football and I don't know what the learning was meant to be out of that but this particular coach didn't rate uh, Dr Joe as a manager okay so what's okay. your take on it <laughs> that is quite bizarre but then I'm sure somebody who is on FIFA's technical committee Mm. Uh, would know what they're doing to manage a small nation to a major 
championship, yep. then you know what you're doing. I think Vengloss was probably the way Janssen happened and the way Janssen ended. And we waited months and months. Now, one, one, of the, one of, he wasn't appointed to the 17th of July, 1998. Mm-hmm. Celtic were into pre-season by this point. Yep. And we were also in a World Cup year, which means a lot of, at that point, Scotland qualified for the World Cup, the last World Cup mm-hmm. that, we, that, we, that we qualified for. And there was a few Celtic players in that squad. You had the sweet. You had um, Henrik as well. Had, was in the, was in the, basically it was a World Cup year. Yeah, and the players arrived back late. The manager arrived back late, and they had no pre season, no pre season whatsoever. Vengos says right at the start of it, it's going to take us months to get up and running here because you're going to have the fatigue with the guys that were at the World Cup, and you've got the the change over time and the change of his philosophy and change of training, change of diet, everything that he wanted to implement, his philosophy was going to take months to implement. And you can have a look at that at that start of the season. Mm. We, we were we were poor at that start of the season. And everything he spoke about came to attrition. He says we would be we would get better from December onwards and we did get better from the December onwards once the players who had came back from the World Cup guys like Burley and Lambert and guys like that had got their edge back so that was December time you look at the run that we went on from the turn of the year to the injury crisis when we ended up losing the league at Celtic Park we are beating teams 7-1 mm-hmm. 5-1 and some of the best football that we've seen played by a Celtic team since Tommy Burns. It was fabulous to watch, but we came up short because the squad was short. You've got the old... That, the game that I'm talking about where we lost the league, Scott Marshall having to get drafted in as a centre-half. So Celtic had a defensive... Crisis. Crisis in, in the heart of the defence. At that point. Wow. We then meekly lost the... The Scottish Cup final that year won nothing to Rangers as well. Rod Wallace scored the winner. Mm-hmm. So the big change that actually happened towards the end of Engloss's time was Alan MacDonald took over from Fergus McCann in April 99. Alan MacDonald believed that Celtic had to spend the same as what Rangers were spending to actually compete. And what was Fergus's advice on a new manager to Alan MacDonald? Can you remember? I can't remember that, no. Do not... A point, Kenny Dalglish. What happened? <laughs> Kenny Dalglish was appointed as director of football. Now, Kenny Dalglish was only appointed director of football because Alan MacDonald found out, as he tells it, that Fergus told him a wee porky. That lie being that Vengos didn't have a get out clause in his contract like Lance, like Janssen had the, Is year, that right? the year before. How many years were we expecting Vengos to stay? What was the contract, Kev? Three years? I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Alan McDonald fully expected Vengos to stay on for the second season. Right. When he took the job. When Vengos says he had no intention of staying on because of just the whole who have round about the club at that point. Alan McDonald then appoints Kenny Douglas, and this sets a ball in motion of what became the John Barnes era. Dream team. Dream team. My take is this. If Vengloss had decided to stay, had been allowed the same money as John Barnes and allowed to sign the players that he wanted, we would have won the league the following season. And my reasoning for that is the form that we had from January to April, I think it was. Mm-hmm. The fact that he would have had a full pre-season and the fact that he would have strengthened the squad. Joseph Vengos only signed four players for Celtic Football Club. That's his legacy, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The four players were Lubo, Johan Mealbe, Vidar Vysef and Mark Viduka. Marco Viduka. Mar- well, he started off as Marco. <laughs> he dropped then, to O. Then, then dropped to O. Now, we had the whole problem with Viduka at that point as well at the we turn did. of the year. We did. 
So my saying is, if that was a calibre of player, right, we can maybe discount Recef as being hit or miss. If he had signed other players of those quality to add to the quality that was already in the squad, mm-hmm. we would have won the league the following season. Well, even if you pick another four, let's say he goes for another four pre-season of that calibre, maybe one of them's a, a Reseth, which I don't think Reseth's ever regarded as a flop as such. Scored in a cup final, stayed for a few years, international player. i seen him at Celtic Park last season. Uh-huh. Um, or was it the season before? Last season was a bit of a write-off. Uh, it was one of the ones, Kevin, if you're then looking at maybe eight players and six of them, you know, That's one of them being Viduka after he dropped the O and came back from Australia, I mean, they, they've got half half a team out of that calibre. So, you know, it's, it's a good enough kind of theory to look back on, but obviously what we did see was something completely different. The, the other thing that I, I didn't mention was when we played the Champions League qualifier against Zagreb, there was all the infighting about the money. That's right. The, the infighting about the bonuses. Mm-hmm. I still, I'll, I'll still say that if Venglos would have got a pre-season, the same money as Barnes, we would have won the league the following season under Venglos, who was a far better manager than probably is given credit for, just because he was only there for the year. And he also got that magnificent 5-1 victory against Rangers as well. And he left us with Lubo. He left us with Lubo and, you know, Mialbi, who thereafter became part of the management team under Neil Lennon. Vida Reseth. Again, I never looked back on Reseth as a flop, Kev. Mm -hmm. He was part of the demolition derby because he was on the front cover of the VHS video that the club (laughs) sold every time they had a good victory. That will release it on video. Brilliant. 5-1. That game... Is that the most memorable moment or, or 90 minutes of Venglos' time at Celtic Park? Um, of course, it's the most, um, what could you say, showpiece mm. game. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to go back to a Sunday night at Fur Park when we beat Motherwell 7-1. Henrik Larson scored four goals. Yep. Also, Joseph Venglos, this is, a, this is another extreme hot take. This is burning this one. Joseph Venglos turned Henrik Larson into the player he became. Is that your theory, or has Henrik th- ever th- spoken th- about that, Doctor that's Joe? That's my theory. And, and how Henrik did he do Larson that? turned him. Uh, sorry, Joe Venglos turned Henrik Larson into a free running centre forward. Right. So he changed his style. He, stained, he changed his style. Mm-hmm. So if you had Larson, who scored thirty-eight goals that season, which was a poor season for yeah. us under Venglos. The following season would have kicked on. It's interesting. He would have kicked on. Now, Kevin, we are getting some comments, so let's have a look through that because what you do is, you know, we're in a situation at the moment where we're broadcasting every day, we're talking about everything that's happening at Celtic Park. We're taking a wee step back 21 years ago, so people are reminiscing about way back when. Stephen Forbes, welcome back to the show, Stephen. You're commenting on YouTube. Was Dr. Joe not given another role in the club after his departure? A European scout. Can't uh, separate memories of Venglos with Hugh Dallas and a rather incident strewn derby. Remember that? He, he became a European technical advisor. Yeah, what did and, that entail? And nobody really knows, and he just sort of left without fanfare 12 months later. So he, he did. So he was there see for out another 12 months. He, see, yeah. he, saw, he saw another 12 months, but in a very reduced capacity. Right, right. And. Um, You know, Kieran is also commenting, their four signings were mega. Everyone outside Reseth was an absolute screamer. The thing with Viduka as well, he comes in, Marco Viduka, and at that time, very much like the kind of treatment of Fergus McCann around the signing, if you remember. Remember the... Uh Was it around about that time where they were actually likening McCann to Saddam Hussein and they called him the dictator? Uh McCann goes out himself... Uh, to Croatia, doesn't he? Goes out to Zagreb to sign Viduka to get the deal done, get it over the line. And of course, they had played us at Celtic Park. And I remember the famous interview after the game that Viduka gave. I don't know if you can remember this, Kevin. He was brilliant. He looked tremendous. He played in the same team as Prozanetsky and all that. You remember? And then after the game, they ask him about Celtic, as these uh, hacks often do. They just throw in the bombshell. And he says, I heard that a lot. Uh, there's a lot of good Catholic boys play for Celtic, so that'll do me. 
and then I think the whole fan base was just sold on that. Eventually it comes along, but then, and this is the thing that um, Laura Brannan's written a brilliant article for us, and we're going to publish it on, on the website, axom.net, Kevin, where Marco Viduca had a mental breakdown, mm-hmm. and he was largely mocked for that. It became almost like a figure of fun for having a mental breakdown and then fleeing back to Australia. And I say mocked, not by fans, but by the, the media. It was like, that was their attitude against Mark Viduca back then. There's a very there's a very dark episode uh, before Vaduka came to us and in Vaduka's own life and after he came as he dropped a, he dr- we laugh about him he came as Marco went away to Australia for four weeks and came back as Mark there's a whole reasoning for his change of name because he reckoned he was a change of person right. after the experiences he had with. Rumoured experiences that he had with how Dynamo Zagreb forced him out of the club. Mm-hmm. He was basically being treated like a piece of meat yep. to move when he didn't want to move. Mm-hmm. And there, there, there is a possible line that he never wanted to be in, go to Glasgow in the first place. Not maybe Celtic, but he never wanted to be there. And that's why he took the breakdown, the pressure that was put on him. To sign for Celtic at he that time. He was forced time. to move, wasn't well, he? was forced he, to move. He, he was forced to move. Yeah. And that's how the whole, he disappeared for four weeks and came back as Mark. Right. So we we have a wee laugh and joke in that, but there was a really dark side to that. But I remember the press at the time. The press took the mickey out of him. Oh, your, your star striker disappeared for four weeks and he's came back as Mark. What's that all about? Well... If you do a bit of investigative journalism, you would maybe find it, mm-hmm. what, what that's about. But we've spoken about this before. Mark Viduk and Heinrich Larson were a partnership for us. Ah, it's, it's quite incredible when you think back and, you know, you, you remember further on, you know, the game against Aberdeen under John Barnes where we're playing Viduka and Henrik and Lubo and Aye. Berkovic. It was an incredible uh, attacking lineup when it clicked and it didn't, obviously go well for Barnes but there were some signs early doors Kevin but Gary Doonan's chipping in via Facebook it was under Dr Joe that Henrik became a goal machine under whim Henrik was deeper well that, that takes my uh, maybe back Gary I know Gary kens a, a lot more about football than me so I'll take that Hen- Henrik Larson scored 38 goals under Joseph Lengos he scored four that, and that's, that was a great Sunday night. This is when Sky, it was a five past six kickoffs mm-hmm. on a Sunday night. Mm-hmm. I don't think I went to my work sober on a Monday for years. Um, back in the good old days. Back in the good old days. Um, or the bad old days, whatever you want to, whatever way I want to take it. Good at uh, the time. Aye, definitely. But that performance at Fur Park that night was unbelievable. I know. The whole Celtic team that night was unbelievable. If you go back and YouTube some of their goals... What what fast flowing great football we ah, played! It was incredible. So I don't think it's a big leap of faith for me to actually say that if we would have allowed Venglos the money, the time to develop his own team, he would have won that league the following season. Now, if you will allow me, if I may, uh, we're talking about the what if scenario, the sliding doors moment, Kev, and there've been so many in in the you know traditions and history of Celtic and in life in general you know you think in moments that it just depends see, that split second decision but what I've been hearing this week quite a bit and I'm not going to go too deep into the conversation is the what if scenario you know the what if scenario uh, you know let's look at last season what if that happens what if the other teams start dropping points what if we turn it round and I just think you know it, it's it's a castle made of sand the what if it just shows you the the scenario you've given us is plausible, totally plausible, but it's a what if, and we're talking about it twenty one years later because ultimately it was a failure. It is a what if, and it was a failure. The decision making was a failure after it. Mm-hmm. The decision making after Vengos was a failure. Should have listened to wee Fergus. Should have listened to Fergus, and they should have gave Vengos another shot. The thing is, though, that one of the main reasons it didn't happen was the treatment of the Scottish press gave Venglos. He just couldn't be bothered with it, basically. But if they could have spoken round, talked him round, this could have happened. There's maybe a world somewhere where that did happen. There's maybe another parallel universe where that did happen. 
but I believe that Vengloss is on me. I believe that Vengloss is unfairly treated, and he was at the right place at the wrong time, mm-hmm. and he never got that time. And I wish he would have had the. Well, do I wish because then Martin O'Neill wouldn't have happened. The, the, Hold that thought. The, the, that's, Hold that, that thought because that's, someone yeah. has commented something along those lines in just a moment, Kevin. Uh, IH Decorating mentions or asks, wasn't Dr. Joe asked to be an Eastern European scout after he left? And that's uh, something that he did do for about 12 months. I always felt actually uh, on that point, and it, you know, it probably wouldn't have been accepted by Ronnie Dyla. I always felt he, Ronnie Dyla was a, a talent spotter. Um, he wasn't ready certainly he might never be ready to be a Celtic manager Kevin and we know that he was meant to be number two to Roy Keane we know all that but I always felt that his talent spotting was something that Celtic could have retained even if it was somewhere else you know uh, obviously Vengloss was looking after certain regions I, d- I just think we missed a trip with Ronnie he could spot a player you know he maybe wasn't the manager we needed but he certainly could spot talent academy manager maybe I, I guess he wouldn't have stepped back I to that degree. Have stepped back, but imagine him working under the regime of Brendan Rodgers. This is a, a big what if sliding door scenario. But he seems to be, be be able to get the best out of younger players. Look at look at uh, Dyla's legacy. You're looking at Joe Venglos there. You know Dyla's uh, legacy. We're, we're still seeing it to this day. McGregor was given his debut mm-hmm. under Ronnie, and uh, obviously we've got Chris Sire and Ryan Christie. Uh, who were both signings under Ronnie Dyla. And there's been others such as the young lad Tierney went down to Arsenal for twenty five million. So, you know, th- there's there's players that he spotted, he gave the chance to. And there's been others at previous clubs, Martin Odegaard famously. Um is he still at Real Madrid? Uh, he's on loan somewhere but he's still at my parent place, clubs yes. Jason Christie hey guys love the show raw and truthful well Jason yeah we are dealing with a lot of kind of issues at the moment at Celtic and I think the best thing to do is try try and be truthful we're not um, throwing out any speculation for the sake of it but you know as I was saying to Kevin earlier on you've got to have an opinion on these things and if you have an opinion and then balance it with some reason and then stick to it and people disagree with that and that's fine Kevin disagrees with a lot of my opinions uh, but what I don't disagree with is your your opinions on uh, the music we're going to be talking about later on in this show as well, Kevin, because it is a, a show that looks at Celtic, a, a very specific period of Celtic's history, and uh, an album that came out at that time as well, because music, you know, you just hear a song, you hear an album, and it transports you back to that time, Kevin, doesn't it? It's got that magical ability. Definitely, and uh, this time, the album that we're going to speak about um, when I put it up on uh, social media yesterday, I got quite a I got quite a decent reaction mm-hmm. that people were looking forward to us talk, talking about it. This album was released on the twenty first of June, nineteen ninety nine, by London Records, and it was made by a Liverpool band called Shack, and the album was HMS Fable. Now the NME have called Shack the greatest band you've never heard. Tell the listeners because Shack, I, I guess. What would you describe them as? Maybe somewhat left field. Um, cult. One of my favourite bands of all time. It's actually quite weird. The album's described as Britpop. Which, oh, which not I don't, that. I'm not having that either. But that's uh, that's what that's what is described under on Wikipedia. If you can trust Wikipedia. Now, Shaq. This incarnation of Shaq was the brothers Mick Head and John Head, uh, Ron Parry and Ian Templeton. Mm-hmm. And HMS Fable was released to wide acclaim in the music press when the music press still carried some weight. You've got to remember the internet had just really started at this point. And what, what was your music bible, Kev? NME. NME. It was the NME. What about your monthly? Select. Right. Select. Are, are you still like Vox? Was that not a Melody Maker monthly Vox? I think it was. Pretty eh? good as well, yeah. aye. So... When the album was released, there was a review and it says, Poetic, touching and sublime. It contains the best sets of songs since Oasis's Definitely Maybe. There you go. Now, you can't get much. Higher praise, because Oasis praise. were still the darlings of and, the music uh, press. But so, the genius in Shaq is Michael William Head. And... 
beforehand, him and his brother John Head were in a band called the Pale Fountains from 1991 to 1990. What a band. No, sorry, 1981 to 1995. Now, the Pale Fountains should have been a big band as well. But there's a, a, a funny story, it's maybe not funny, but there's an interesting story. They were going to appear, appear on top of the pops mm-hmm. for the Pale Fountains song called Jeans Not Happening. What a track. It's a fun, again, anybody... Uh, Never heard it. Go and look it up on YouTube. What a track. If you look it up on YouTube, you'll hear there's a big orchestra behind. So the Pale Fountains were going to appear on top of the Pops. And their appearance on top of the Pops was kiboshed because the orchestra, the BBC paid £50 a musician. So if you were a band on top of the Pops, you got £50 a head. That was your appearance fee. Mm -hmm. The Pale Fountains wanted an orchestra behind them. And the BBC refused to pay the orchestra £50 a head. So the band walked out and never made their Top of the Pops appearance. And their appearance on Top of the Pops was took by Keith Harris Harris and Orville. My big sister had that single. See, the thing with, with the Pale Fountains, I've got to admit, and it's just a point of reference, Kev, that I found them retrospectively after discovering Shaq. Mm-hmm. And the Pale Fountains... They were given a record deal, a record, record deal from Virgin, from Richard Branson back then, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And they were um, really the, the new darlings, uh, the stable at Virgin. They released two albums. There's a third compilation, which is still a stunning, stunning album. But Nick Head during that period, um, he comes from a, a great tradition of outstanding Liverpudlian musicians. But he was battling uh, drug addiction. I mean, Mick Head was in a relationship with Patsy Kensett. I'm not sure if you knew that. So she, he was in a relationship with Patsy Kensett. And he remembers, he spoke over the last couple of years, a great interview on YouTube where he speaks about his descent into heroin addiction and how he, he thought it was, that he had a romantic idea that it would improve his kind of artistic uh, talent. And obviously it never does. It never does, does it? But um, he spoke about that descent into heroin addiction, which has obviously affected his um, creativity, creativity and his output and his behaviour and his relationships mm-hmm. ever since, sporadically, mm-hmm. sporadically. But um, those issues, the roots of those issues were way back in the, the Paley's days, back in the 80s. Uh, I mean, the early 80s, Liverpool and Glasgow and any inner city areas, the heroin was rife. Uh, round about that time you're you're in the grips of Tory rule and minor strikes and high unemployment and it was a blight to all the the managed um, decline the managed decline especially Liverpool Mm. Um, it's amazing it always puzzles me how heroin is seen as this rock and roll chic drug when everyone else sees the effects of heroin on local communities every single it's not a rock and roll drug when you see what it can actually do to people, but it seems to have this early 70s uh, that bands would dabble in heroin. And John Cooper Clark talks about it as well because he was a heroin addict for a number of years as well. Yeah, yep. It's some sort well, he was he was a uh, loving me Nico for the Velvet Underground at the time. Um, so it's got this sort of Cool. There's, there's a mystique. Uh, there is a mystique a chic about mystique. it. But then most heroin users are not Pete Dockery. No, no, no. It's, 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 a, it's a scourge on families and communities and society in general. And I think the big thing for me, Kevin, where people with addiction issues um, is compassion. Mm-hmm. It's about compassion uh, because there is a mother there, there's a father, there's a brother, there's a daughter uh, who are suffering due to the uh, unfortunate path that someone is going down and a lot of the time with the music industry it's almost like a safety net isn't it because they can get them clean especially if they're selling a lot of records and they can come in and out of addiction but it's not quite like that at the street level is it? No not at all and I'm sure in that interview you're talking about about Mick he's quite honest Mm. about his his alcohol issues as well and how his addiction issues have probably mean that he is a lost genius among gifted songwriters because they never got that break on top of the pops. But he's maybe never been in the mental state of mind to make the most of 
opportunities that have come this way. Remember the early, there was early video footage of him and they asked him about that and it was the transition from Pale Fountains to Shaq. In fact, the interview might have made it into You'll Never Walk Alone, oh, the documentary uh, mm-hmm. uh, from the French director. And he spoke about, well, they never made it because he was a spoil sport. Mm-hmm. And I often wonder the psychology, the state of mind behind that, whereby you almost, you know, you're destined never to make it because you don't think you deserve it. And there's a lot of people who, there's a self-destruct button. And just before they're about to make the big time, they self-destruct. I know, it's quite, must, is it something to do with creativity? If it, is it something to do with, you put anything out there, I can only talk for myself, that if I write something that goes out there, I know I've got major doubts once it goes out. And sometimes you hang back with stuff and you don't put it out there because you didn't want it out there. You don't want to be seen as a failure. You don't. It's a self-esteem issue. Mm. more than anything and there is a really interesting interview with Chris Allison who worked with Shaq and he says about Mick absolute genius but never finishes anything mm. I know how he feels <laughs> so <laughs> there, there, there seems my fourth book <laughs> there seems to be a, an element of a creative doubt there and even, uh, even though he's got the magic as this album actually proves it just seems to be that he doesn't want to... I, I think it's a self-esteem issue, maybe. You mentioned the word magic. You can't see the screen. Some people watching this might think you've just read that off the screen, but uh, Nanoplastic CSC, good good name, is commenting on YouTube, and he says that if we didn't have Barn, the Barnes debacle, uh, Venglos had stayed, we wouldn't have had Martin O'Neill's magic. So there you go. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that if... Vengos had stays, I reckon that we would have won the league the following season. Before we get back to Shaq, because we might, we might be introducing some people to the band, and uh, we'll talk a wee bit more, after, quite a bit more, about Mick Head and Shaq. Uh, some great comments coming through, Kevin. Uh, Pat, you're saying our Celts for change back. <laughs> <laughs> you would have thought that if you've listened to our broadcast over the last couple of days, but AGSC Technology Videos, I recall a brilliant away UEFA game against FC Zurich under Dr. Joe. Absolutely brilliant. A match with us in black, lime, and green. Ah, that's right. It was, uh, the that's the one with the big umbro. The big umbro uh, in the middle. That was a cracker. I was a. I was actually a kit that I didn't. I wasn't fond at the time, but over the years, I'm looking back and I'm thinking it was especially with the it long the de- sleeves. It was the detail. Yeah. The detail in the black as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was smart. It, it's aged well. And the thing with that as well, talking about the detail is. In European games, actually, because obviously talking about fourth books, we'll not get into that now. Um, what I realised through the collector scene is that there was a different version that they wore in the European games, and it was just black and green. Whereas the one you're talking about had a, a grey crest throughout the, Aye, that's, the black. That's the one. So in the European games, you know you've got a rare uh, match worn strip if it's just black. Um, Joe Porter, the only snow excuse depiction of Dr. Joe was fabulous. And we've got Terry Tibbs. Viduka was a world-class player. Now, there's an interesting point. Mark Viduka was a world-class player. We have spoken a wee bit about him because I compared him, although you wouldn't agree with this if you watched him at Pataudry. I, I, I compared his style to a Yeti. And what I meant by that was the holding up play, that, you know, the, the, the ball retention that, that a Yeti seems to have through strength, upper body strength, and he's laying the ball off. And then you find them, you know, making progress into the box. Are you you agreed with that, didn't you? The Yeti Viduka comparison. That's what, he's got the same sort of. Doesn't feet. have the height. He doesn't have the the height, but he's got the same sort of feet as him. Same sort of touch. Same sort of body movement as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, Viduka for we speak about football cliches all the time on this program, but he had a, a great touch for a big man because he was a unit. He, he wasn't a. He wasn't slim, he was well built and he could shift as well. Mm. Um, was he world class? He had a well, he had a really, really decent career, but I, I, would, I wouldn't say... He performed he well. Class. Remember the, the Australian team that done really well at the World Cup? Viduka was part of that, wasn't he? They reckoned it was a, the fittest team at the World Cup. That was the stipulation by the, the gaffer at that time, mm-hmm. get them fit. And it performed really well. I think Viduka was part of that, but it was a team that was never going to progress as such. I think they gave a good account of themselves, mm-hmm. but, you know, maybe Harry Kuehl was part of that as well. If I'm was remembering Kuehl right. 
the that kind of team. There was a, there was a good clutch of players in that international side. Yeah, of course, he went down to um, Leeds. The English. He played with Middlesbrough. Played with Leeds. Played with Newcastle. Newcastle. You know, and then and I like this sometimes with players just disappear into relative obscurity, just to you know retire. The quiet life. I sometimes like that about footballers, Kev. I sometimes watch Sky Sports, the breaking news, and they're, they're maybe zooming into somebody's living room and it's Dwight York or Andy Cole. And I sometimes wonder, why are you doing that? Why don't you just take it easy and retire? And Is it, is it a need to feel relevant? I don't know. It's maybe they've got a book coming out or um, something to promote or... I, I really... When, going back to Viduka, if you have a look at Viduka... I reckon he's disappearing, just disappearing suited him when you see the episode that he had when he signed for us. Yeah. It was just, I've done my career now, I'm, I'm out of the limelight. I don't need the limelight. I don't need the limelight anymore, yeah. I'm just going to go back to Australia, I think he went back to, and live my life out there. Uh, he, he was a... He was There's a, something to admire there. Mm-hmm, you definitely. know, rather than constantly need the celebrity um, attention uh, after the... After the floodlights fade, but AGSC Technology Videos, uh, welcome to the show via YouTube. And you reckon that Viduka had tough times during the Yugoslav Civil War years and other personal issues, apparently, something about the local mafia. Um, so, yeah, deep lying mental issues. Mental issues. And yeah. I've mentioned John Potter on the podcast a few times, always name dropping John, but we did play in the same school team and played for Valfield Boys Club. John was exceptional as a youth player. He's now obviously part of Jack Rossi's management team at Hibs. And John was the captain of the Celtic reserve team the night that Viduka made his debut. And he remembers Viduka turning up five, ten minutes before kick-off, you know, just a wee bag over his shoulder. Ivana, was it Ivana? Was that his girlfriend at the time? In tow. And he was just absolutely, he was just a genius performer. But that was his debut. I think it was against St Johnston reserves. And Big Potts was the captain that night. That was him coming back. I remember his debut for the first team, which was at Capolo, Scottish Cup tie. Mm-hmm. He scored two goals that night. That was on a Monday night. That was, that was a strange night, a Monday night at Capolo. Uh, Gary Doonan, uh, over Viduka when he didn't turn up for the Hearts game. Fergus was on a plane to Zagreb right away to get her cash back. Um, and Viduka was not Australian. No, he did he, he did represent Australia through, was it his uh, mother? Mother. Uh, and he did, as far as I know, retire to Australia. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure he did, didn't he? So certainly capped by Australia and represented them at the there, World there's Cup. There's quite a lot of Croatians have got uh, Croatian Aussies mm. in, in sport. It's quite a common, I don't know where, how the migrations actually work there, but there seems to be quite a lot of Croatians that have got Australian parents. Mm-hmm. And Potts was also in the dressing room the night that Vim Janssen came in and broke the news after uh, the friendly match against Sport and Lisbon, which was part of the George Cadet deal. And obviously Sport and Lisbon was Joe Venglos' former club and he managed Sport and Lisbon when we beat them 5-0 at Celtic Park. So everything links in, Kev. But Highland Jinx 88 um, states that Vim Janssen, what a manager he was. Rafa, for me, to be honest. He would have gone for Rafa. We were linked with Omar Colley. Sam Doria defender, but we went for a duffer that can't get into the Brighton team. If it wasn't for Vim, we wouldn't have seen the King. Quite a few points in that there. Uh, so straight straight away, um, what a manager he was. Rafa for me, are we talking now? Are we talking the here and now, Rafa? Um, you know, we were talking about new managers yesterday, Kevin, that uh, created quite a lot of dialogue, quite a lot of discussion amongst the Celtic support. As for Duffy, I mean, I've not been overly critical. I've blamed him for some of the goals because you can't get away from the blame. He's been to blame for quite a lot of the goals. And Omar Colley was a player that I think you brought up uh, first and foremost on the podcast. You were the first guy to mention it on our podcast, at least. And you had been keeping an eye on him at Sampdoria. And uh, I think Fulham came into the transfer race at some stage, did they not? He's still at Sampdoria, eh? So maybe that says everything that we need to know. Right, I do understand that Janssen did bring in um, Larson and there, there is sort of a kindred spirit between Larson and Janssen but as Gary Doonan says and I've, I've quite pointed out that he played a different role under Janssen and the Larson that we all know and love was created under Dr Yen- Venglos Terry Tibbs asked a question um, and I've often wondered this about uh, Dr Dre but was he really a doctor Dr Joe? 
Uh, Pretty sure he was. I'm sure he was, aye. I wouldn't put anything past him. Um, Reseth had the best red card ever in a Glasgow derby. Uh, took out Rainey, I think it was, then just walked straight off he the park. Off, Didn't right. even look at the ref. Class. <laughs> AGSC technology videos. Um, some good, some good um, memories here for Celtic fans going back in time, 21 years. Barca boy, what if only work if we learn from history? We've not done that enough. Um, what if only? What if? Only work if we learn from history. Mm-hmm. What if? And I think that that has been a wee bit of frustration for me over the last couple of days, Kevin, because a lot of the arguments have been, but what if? And then referring to last season as if, you know, this season is going to replicate last season. And it's not. This season is, is the here and now. Um, people think I've been, you know, kind of quick to point the finger at Neil Lennon. You have been discussing today about how you feel that there's a wider issue at Celtic Park in the highest echelons of the club. We've got a really interesting email this morning from Australia, from a fan, and uh, I think we'll have a look at that tomorrow. Some great points in that as well. But yeah, you're talking about the what-if scenario, and it only works if we learn from our history. Um, now, what did we learn from the the John Barnes era that then ensued, Kevin? What did we learn from that period of our history? Um, I think what we learned was... You had to point, I mean, the next manager was Martin O'Neill. So what we learned was you had to appoint, you, you, you look at the names that, have, that were linked, Gus Hiddink mm-hmm. and Martin O'Neill were the two that were always at the forefront. And you, you were going for John Barnes to what would now be called an elite, man, a elite level manager. I think we've only ever appointed two in the history of the club. Now, I mean, Martin. by elite, we're, we're looking at Jockstein. Was Jockstein an elite manager when Celtic appointed him? Was he what would be classed as an elite manager or was he an up-and-coming manager at that stage, having done so well at Dunfermline? Up-and-coming stuff. Up-and-coming, so he's won trophies and uh, done well, well in Europe um, as well. So, you know, we know he became an elite manager, became the greatest manager of all time. You know, prove me wrong on that because people might throw Sir Alex Ferguson and Bill Shankly and various other managers but you know the elite manager status Kevin I think we've only ever appointed two Martin O'Neill was the first Brendan Rodgers I said yeah I think so I think so and that that was my point yesterday when we were discussing discussing rather uh, the appointment of elite managers and it's easy to mock it's easy to mock but I think that that's where we need to actually invest now how much does it take probably twice as much as what Neil Lennon's getting at the moment uh, but that's the price of a failed striker, of which we have purchased many over the years. And I think it's more important than yet another striker or yet another uh, punt in the transfer market. I think the, the management is something that's far more important. De- definitely. It's, uh, if they go back and listen to the bulletin before, I, I reckon that there has been, there has been a drop in uh, the culture, a change in culture. At the club, and you ha- you have a look at it. If we go back to this point, Vengloss brought in one culture, John Barnes brought in another, then Martin O'Neill brought in the winning culture. Yep, straight after it, Vengloss was maybe an elite coach. Maybe you can have got a better coach than uh, Doctor Joe Vengloss when we appointed him at that time. I mean, his credentials were second to none, even though none of the Scottish press had had actually heard him. Uh, but Martin O'Neill was the third best manager in England bar behind Wenger and Alex Ferguson. You made a statement getting Martin O'Neill. Mm. You made a statement getting Brendan Rodgers. Yep. So I understand what the, the commenters are saying, that if Wenglos would have got that setting season, um, we wouldn't have had Martin O'Neill, but that's the fun of us. That's the fun that... The what-if scenarios. The, the yeah. what-if scenarios. And I think there's enough facts there. To back up, I think Vengos would have been a success in the following season. Here's another what if, and it's coming in from Tam Mannion. Now, Tam, thank you very much for getting involved. You do so regularly on the, the bulletins, and this is a slightly different one because this is a show that we call uh, a Celtic State of Minds Screamer Celica, where Kevin picks an album that shaped his life, and we look at what was going on in the world of Celtic at that time. Um, and Tam says, if Henrik hadn't broken his leg in Leon, Martin O'Neill wouldn't have become the manager. 
Barnsley season probably wouldn't have been a total disaster and he'd been kept on. Seville probably wouldn't have happened. I'm going to disagree with that. I'm I'm going to disagree with that. I still reckon that John Barnes's tenure would have ended because of the mess in the dressing room. The inner wranglings, yeah. Yeah. I think and um, he's admitted that himself. Well, we he admitted it on our podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, we I think it was back in June. Got the opportunity to speak to John Barnes for ninety minutes, and he did admit the fact that uh, obviously the results uh, weren't great near the end, but there were behind the scenes issues at that time, weren't they? Mm-hmm. He, he admits that. So I, I did. I did wonder if somebody would bring that up because it is a as a perfect what if scenario. Uh, but I do think the 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 toxic culture that was behind Barnes's dressing room at that point, which he's admitted himself with a with a with a saw his tenure end, mm-hmm. and also player power, play, the player power, and also Dermot Desmond's power play, mm-hmm. which ended up with Martin O'Neill being appointed. AGSC Technology Videos, welcome back. You are commenting via YouTube, and if anyone's watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Vengloss was vilified by the Scotch press as a dirty old man, and it was ageism. It certainly was. We're talking was, about ageism eh? here. We're talking about a lack of awareness around mental health with Marco Viduca. Also, his spoken English wasn't that good, and that didn't help. Now, I, I do remember that was the kind of view. Uh, he was kind of vilified, wasn't he, as a it dirty was, old man? It was. You know? And that was one of the reasons why he never he, he never stayed on. And it's probably the main reason that he that he wasn't that he never stayed on. Then again, you can look back on this and go, well, did the club try hard enough to keep him on? Or did Alan McDonald just right away go to Kenny Douglas? He was intoxicated with the idea of Kenny Douglas returning as a manager at Celtic. He didn't quite return as a manager. He eventually did get the the, the job on an interim basis, but uh, you know, come high, you know, at the end of the day, M- McDonald was always going to bring uh, Dalglish back, even though that was the parting wish of Fergus McCann. Don't bring back Kenny Dalglish. Now Gary Doonan disagrees with you, Kev. Oh. Another what if? What if Henrik hadn't broken his leg under Barnes? Uh, we were decent up to that point. Viduka, Henrik, and Berkovic were on fire. What if? As a what if, but as I've said, I still think the, the dressing room would have brought down Barnes. Well, there was that, but again, one of the things he tried to do was to uh, shift Craig Burley to Derby, wasn't he? Uh, so Burley, who was one of the agitators in the dressing room uh, during that time. Now, Gordon Campbell, welcome to the show, Gordon. Um, and he confirms that Dr. Joe had a doctorate in PE and psychology. Here you go. Right. Now, we'll come back to the points in just a few moments, but... Um, on the point of Shaq, uh, Michael Head, or Mick Head as he's known, is the front man and main songwriter of Shaq, um, who had a number of probably low-key albums based on the fact that they were released on labels that went bust or in record studios that went on fire. And uh, they released an album in 1988, which was a brilliant uh, precursor to the Stone Roses debut. It was called Zilch. And if you listen to that, you know, it's fantastic to the point where I even checked who produced it because I was absolutely convinced it was John Lecky and it might have been John Lecky. Uh, what followed was Water Pistol in 1995, the much delayed Water Pistol. Um, and there's a song on that called Undecided, which is just mm-hmm. blissful. And then the third album, HMS Fable, in 1999. Now, around about that time, NME were waxing lyrical about Mick Head being the greatest songwriter you've never heard. Uh, Shaq were the band, the Stone Roses were never good enough to be. That was another quote in the enemy. Not quite sure about that. I wouldn't like to separate the two uh, because for me, the chemistry that existed within the four Stone Roses, and I'm of course meaning John Squire, Ian Brown, Rennie and Manny, was something that was a once in a generation uh, chemistry. Uh, it's a completely different thing with the Head Brothers and, and Shaq and they're built sometimes on a bit of chaos, aren't they? Yes, definitely. I don't think they're talking to each other now. I don't think they've spoke to each other for a number of years. Somebody might actually correct me on that. Um, HMS Fable came out, and I remember the first time I heard it, and it was my cousin's house, and they brought out this album with the, the ship on the front of it. And I'm going, what's that? 
And he says, oh, what's it, this, this is a, this is a great songwriter. I remember the NME. He was on the front cover of the NME, Nick, Nick uh, Mickhead. And that was, a, that was the... A tagline. That was a tagline, the greatest songwriter you've never heard. The album opens with a song called Natalie's Party. Mm-hmm. Now, Natalie's Party is a story about some village somewhere, and it sounds like the greatest 21st that you've never been to. You want to go to Natalie's Party by the end of the song. And it's got that sort of... It's got a Liverpool vibe to it, but it's not wholly Liverpool, if you, if you know what I mean. Yep. It's got this Beatles vibe, it's got... Uh, Love the psychedelic vibe. The, the sea shanties. It's got the sea shanty. Yep. Right, but it's got this hook. It's got this catchy sensibility. Is it the, the is it the psychedelia that you used to get from Love? Um, Forever Changes by Love. And remember, I had the discussion with Edgar as well. You, there is a bit of that. And you see a lot more of that in Mick's later career, Kev. Mm-hmm. And we all know how much uh, Liverpool love love. And in particular, forever changes. We spoke about that when Edgar Summertime is up. Um, there is, but it doesn't sound. You can hear more of the love influence, I reckon, on Mick solo stuff. The red elastic you, band stuff. The red elastic band stuff. That's because of the horns and that, isn't uh, it? Uh-huh. Then what you can hear on uh, this album. This album is. It's not a brick pop album. It's got this decent songs on it. It's got songs that should have been massive. The setting song on the album, comedy. Right, everybody knows there she goes by the lads mm. by another lost genius Lee Mavers comedy should have been Mick Heads there she goes comedy and I've said this before should have been on every movie soundtrack ever romantic comedy soundtracks that's a perfect song oh it's, it's absolutely it's, beautiful there's still but a bit and John Head plays a massive part in Shaq's sound because of the guitar lines and there's a bit in the comedy when the guitar solo comes in. The hairs on my back of my neck stand up every time it comes in. Mm-hmm. Then, but about Mick, he's got a great voice. He's got a voice that drifts in the wind. That's like a balloon floating in the wind. Like a, a wee laddie's lost his balloon. He's let it go. It looks beautiful and sad at the exact same time. Because you've got the wee laddie greeting because he's lost his balloon. But this balloon looks apps looks absolutely glorious as it's floating in there. Mick's got that kind of voice. Because you look at some of the lyrical content that he, that he sings about on HMS Fable, um, like Lenders Some Do, mm. which is basically a, a tale of him being up all night in a heroin withdrawal. Mm-hmm. But it's done in a sort of Diggsy's Dinner type throwaway, throwaway effort, if you know if you know what I mean. Um, streets of Kenny it's basically about going to find heroin in the streets of Liverpool yep. but it's absolutely beautiful the way it, the, the way it's done um, it's just a fun rein, you've got reinstated Captain's Table which we can't go if it, if it mentioned the Primal Scream Martin Duffy for the Primal Scream plays the, the piano on the Captain's Table mm-hmm. the, the song Captain's Table it's a fantastic album it's one of these timeless albums which it should have been massive at that point. But then I think when I think back to ninety nine, there's there's maybe a bit of a backlash to the whole Britpop thing. But that We're coming point, to the tail end. Come, well, it's finished. Yeah. I reckon Britpop finished in nineteen. I'm amazed that that could even be categorised in that. But you've got bland bands at that point, bland indie guitar bands at that point, and that sort of music wasn't flavour of the month anymore. And there was maybe just a misstep in time. And even though writers, critics, guys like ourselves absolutely loved that album, it never made that breakthrough because it was out of step. If that album was released in 1995, say, it would have been absolutely massive. Aye, because it would have just, you know... It would have fitted perfectly. Surfed on the wave of all these bands who were releasing albums. I mean, even if you think about the success of bands like Cast and uh, John Power being the former bass player of the Laz, and not a patch in terms of a lyricist or a songwriter when you look at Mick Head. Uh, But you're right, it's really a misstep in time. If you think about HMS Fable, what then came afterwards, they followed it up four years later with a phenomenal, kind of understated album called Here's Tom With The Weather. 
and then we got the final uh, chunk in 2006 uh, on the corner of Miles and Gill. Gil. So there's another wee Celtic connection because that's Miles Davis and Gil Scott Heron that he's talking about in the title of that album. Now that final album was released on Sewer Mass Records mm-hmm. and if for anybody that doesn't know, Sewer Mass Records is no Gal- was no Gallagher's record company mm-hmm. and I think it was Sony gave him money and says go and get somebody to record an album and he had to track down McHead. He says he wanted to release an album by Mick Head because he was an absolute genius. You know, Noel was recently interviewed about the fact that he's built a studio in his house and he's just going to release loads and loads of music. And he, he, he suggested he might even release a covers album. And they asked him for some of the songs he might cover. He says, something by Shaq. So, you know, Noel's always been a big fan. And uh, also when you're thinking about some of the bands that, that Mick's been in, the Pale Fountains being his first... Uh, that released anything then Shaq then a one off album with his brother John The Magical World of the Strands unbelievable it is a heroin album but it's an That's unbelievable a album and he's now uh, with the Red Elastic band as well but it always it always amazes me it always amazes me Kevin the amount of talent that comes out of Liverpool now a few weeks back we had an interview with Edgar Summertime Jones the final touches to the the session that we did, the live acoustic session, are currently being put to that, and that's going to be released as a video with eight brand new songs from the forthcoming album. Something of an exclusive for us. Uh, the Head Brothers, Mick and John, the Griffiths Brothers of the Real People, and of course Lee Mavers, and then you've got all your others like uh, you know Ian McCulloch. Not so much a lost genius, but just a genius. Just a and genius. Uh, you've also got people then moving into some of the lesser known acts like Tramp Attack and the Bandits and all these different bands up to the likes of the Zootons and the Coral. Unbelievable talent coming out of Liverpool. It's, I reckon it's something to do with the sea air. I think it's something to do with the fact that they're an immigrant city and I've said that before. Uh, there's creativity because they've got a outward looking point of view because they've always been looking to the sea. Now, that's what I reckon anyway, it's probably wrong but that, that's how I get it and this takes me back this, this now takes me on to my other hot take that I came up with when we says we were going to do this Just album. something to leave the listeners Just something to leave to the ponder. listeners with. Yep. Now, you mentioned before uh, Water Pistol, mm. the, the album before uh, HMS Fable, and Water Pistol was released in 1995. Water Pistol was actually meant to be released in 1991, yep. but the studio went on fire. And they couldn't find the tapes. And eventually the tapes were found in a taxi in America by the producer Chris Allison. By the point between 1991 and 1995, the band had split up. Mick had disappeared in a, his own wee world of addiction. And the album didn't come out to 1995. Now you mentioned John Power being the bass player in the was. Pete Wilkinson, who was the bass player in Cast, then Le- was the bass player in sorry. Pete Wilkinson was the bass player in Shack, then left to join Cast mm-hmm. because Water Pistol never came out. So let's step this back. Nineteen ninety Manchester. When Water Pistol was released in nineteen ninety five. It was called an instant, a lost classic, timeless, and would inspire a generation. Now, if you listen to Water Pistol now, if that album would have came out in 1991, it would have been the biggest album of that year. It captures that sort of post-bagginess perfectly. So basically, they're four years out of step. They're four, they always just seem to be out of step, <laughs> eh? So, that album comes out, right? Liverpool becomes a new Manchester and every record company in the world goes to Liverpool. The stairs, who are already on go discs at that point, become absolutely massive, which they deserve to do, which they still deserve to do, actually. The real people at that time, the Griffiths brothers, as, as you've mentioned, the real people had recorded an album called Marshmallow Lane, which was due to come out in 1991. The record company never put never put it out. That would have been their second album. That would have been their second album. The record company never put it out, and it was eventually released in two thousand and twelve. Two thousand and twelve, that album eventually comes out. Yeah. 
Water Pistols released Liverpool Kicks Off. The record company released Marshmallow Lane with the real people. They become massive as well because it's another it's another fantastic album that captures that time. That album doesn't come out, so the real people then go on tour with the Inspiral Carpets mm-hmm. to North America. On that tour, Tony Griffiths strikes up a conversation with a mono browed roadie called No Gallagher. And No asks him about, he knows that the real people have got a studio. So he asks if he can bring his, him and his brother down to their studio to record some songs. That session, which was 1993, then becomes the legendary live demonstration demo yep. for Oasis. What I'm actually saying is, if Water Pistol is released in 1991, then Marshmallow Lane is released. The real people never support the Spiral Carpets. Tony Griffiths never meets Noel Gallagher and Oasis didn't become the band that they become. Because Tony Griffiths also co-wrote a couple of the songs on Columbia, Definitely Columbia, Supersonic, Rockin' Chair. He was never given credit for Columbia or Supersonic, was he? he no, they settled out of court. Right. So, also, the fact that Mick Head didn't become the greatest loving songwriter with Water Pistol, no getting released in 1991, left the door open for No Gallagher. Well, I always remember Clinton Boone saying to us when the Spirals had split up and he was on the dole and he had the milk tokens and he had to go to the supermarket. And bearing in mind that he had auditioned Noel Gallagher as the lead singer of Inspiral Carpets and knocked him back just a few years before. Mm-hmm. And he's in getting milk with milk tokens and across the tannoy, across the music player, in the superstore, is Live Forever. Written by the aforementioned Noel Gallagher. A song that they had heard him and Mark Coyle playing in uh, Inspiral Carpet sound checks. It just shows you how uh, these things can happen, Kevin. We're in a, a bit of a crossroads at the moment, I think in terms of where Celtic go now as well. Um, I'm getting the feeling that uh, there's a lot of people who agree with that that view and many, many others who don't. But that just shows you the what-if scenario, the sliding doors moments um, in life, Kevin, in music, in football that, and in art. The music one there is a bit cosmic, but I, that, can, that could have seriously happened. It certainly could. Now, one of the bands you mentioned, The Stairs, the lead singer and uh, founder member of The Stairs is Edgar Summertime Jones, who came up to join us at State of Mind Studios at the beginning of September. The session was fully recorded and the video will be released in the next couple of weeks. It's an acoustic session by Edgar Jones, who is an icon from the Liverpool music scene, an absolute genius, Kevin. Now, we've had loads of comments. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. The normal Axon Bulletin will be back tomorrow at 12.30. So all that's left for me to say is Kevin Graham. Thanks again for joining us with Screamer Celica. Thank you very much, lads. 